Welcome to Arab Center, uh, Washington. My name is Khalil Jashan. I'm executive director uh, of the center. Uh, I welcome you to this special event today, uh, focusing on uh, the Israeli uh, annexation. As uh, all of you know, for the past several months, actually, and particularly the last few weeks, uh, this issue of annexation of Palestinian uh, territory by Israel uh, advocated, if you will, uh, and supported uh, by the Trump uh, uh, administration uh, has become a controversial issue, both uh, in, in the States uh, and beyond. It has become controversial uh, here in Washington. It has become controversial in Palestine. It has become controversial in Israel itself. Uh, the threatened deadline for implementation was uh, July 1st, and even though uh, nothing dramatic happened on July 1st, but the process uh, seemed to be uh, uh, continuing. So uh, today, in spite of the fact that so many articles and so many uh, uh, policy papers have been written on the subject, frankly, uh, over the past few weeks, uh, more questions have been raised than answers uh, given to uh, shed some more light uh, on these issues and hopefully give a few more answers, particularly uh, with regards to the Palestinian uh, perspective uh, from a practitioner, uh, practitioner's uh, angle, uh, we are going to focus on Israeli annexation and beyond <coughs> assessing the Palestinian uh, options. And to do so, we are very honored and very delighted to have my good friend, Dr. Saeb Arakat with us uh, uh, today to, to help us deal with uh, this subject. Saeb doesn't need an introduction, but for the sake uh, of those of you who might not uh, be aware uh, of, of his contribution uh, in this field, let me just say that uh, he is uh, currently the Secretary General of the PLO uh, Executive Committee. He has been in this position since uh, July of 2015. Uh, and he's also a member of Fatah's uh, Central Committee and of the Palestinian Legislative uh, Council. Uh, Dr. Saeb has served for many years as the chief Palestinian negotiator. Uh, people uh, jokingly in a way, but it's true. He is the in memory, the Palestinian-Israeli uh, peace process because he has been uh, present uh, at that process since, uh, since the creation, not Adam and Eve, but the creation of the, <laughs> of the process. Uh, so uh, it's always interesting to discuss uh, these issues uh, with him. Um, he was involved in all the, the, the major uh, waves of few negotiations, going back to Camp David, going back to Taba, going back uh, to Washington, and, and, and what have you. Uh, previously, Dr. Arikat was also involved internally in different aspects of Palestinian politics, including the uh, heading the Central Elections Commission, uh, in, in, in the past, and uh, has also served uh, uh, in the Madrid uh, Peace Conference as vice chair of the uh, delegation, the Arab delegation, uh, to that uh, conference. Uh, academically, as you know, uh, he's uh, uh, started as an academic in Palestine, and he served as professor uh, of political science at uh, Najah uh, University, and also dabbled with the media uh, for a while. I remember he served uh, on the editorial board of Al Quds and, and published uh, a very popular uh, column and series, endless number of articles actually that we can't even begin uh, to uh, pinpoint. Uh, Dr. Erekat holds uh, a PhD in uh, peace studies from Bradford University, BA and MA in international relations from the University of San Francisco. So he has spent many years uh, and is fully uh, aware and informed of American life uh, and, and American uh, politics. Uh, again, uh, I uh, have the pleasure today to introduce to you Dr. Saeb Arakat, who will uh, present uh, his perspective uh, on the annexation issue in about 20, 25 minutes, <laughs> and then we will all engage uh, in the art uh, of conversation uh, for the balance uh, of our uh, hour. Uh, Dr. Saeb, please. Thank you, Halil. I'm honored to be with you today at the Arab Center. I just want to begin by saying that the date you mentioned, July 1st, uh, is not the deadline. It's the starting line. 
Right. And uh, that's Article 28, to 29th to the coalition agreement between Gantz and, and Netanyahu. It's going to begin by trying to give a summary of the 51 pages of politics and the so-called Peace to Prosperity Plan. Uh, and I just want to say to everyone that I have engaged this American team 37 times in 2017. Four times with my President Mahmoud Abbas, with President Trump, and 33 times at my level with uh, uh, Mr. Kushner, Greenblatt, uh, Friedman, and uh, Avi Berkovich. And that we have done everything humanly possible in order to uh, contribute to what, what we were promised by them, by this team, as the deal of the century and uh, reaching an agreement because no one benefits more from reaching an agreement more than Palestinians and what, no one stands lose more in the absence of an agreement more than Palestinians. Then it turned out that this team was telling us in every meeting that everything else failed, all other engagements failed, all other ideas failed, and uh, <laughs> so we were thinking what, what, what will succeed, I mean, what will succeed and then they decided to take my job as the chief Palestinian negotiator, and they thought that they know the interest of Palestinians better. And uh, we heard uh, myself, my president, the rest of the Palestinian leadership uh, uh, about the details of the deal of the century, the prosperity to peace or peace to prosperity, uh, through watching TV, like you and like the Nigerians and like the Guatemalans and like the to cut the long story short, I can assure you, Khalil, and those listening to me, that uh, Kushner copied and pasted Netanyahu's ideas. I would say 100% adaptation of the Israeli narrative, of the Israeli position, in all core issues. And just to give a, a, a three-minute summary, their position on board, we have agreed, and in the mutual contract between us and the Israeli, the contractual nature, is that there was a mutual recognition between the PLO and Israel, and then when there were issues like Jerusalem, border settlement, refugee security, uh, and borders that will be negotiated between the two sides. And third, no side should take any steps that may preempt or prejudge the results of these issues outside the negotiations. And, and, and uh, number four, uh, the purpose of the peace process was to implement resolution 242 and 338. They didn't say on the basis of it, said the implementation of the inadmissibility of acquisition of territory by force. Then um, the, the team came out with the idea of borders, and I'm, I'm, I'm quoting now, Palestine will have no borders with any Arab, with the neighbors, Jordan and Egypt. Uh, Palestine will have 1,700 kilometers uh, surrounded by Israel, and uh, there will be 17 Israeli settlements within the Palestinian territories, 16,500 Israelis will be under uh, total Israel control and sovereignty. And there will be uh, roads in the uh, in Palestinian areas, 170 kilometers, that will be under Israel sovereignty to serve their communications with the areas that they will annex. And there will be 106,000 Palestinians in 43 uh, uh, villages also annexed, but they will not be given any rights equal to the Israelis. Uh, and then the, 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 any, the, the Palestinians would live as described by Netanyahu, and he used the terms enclaves, enclaves. Uh, and security, the overriding, west of the Jordan River, Israel will retain the overriding security responsibility, period. Israel will have total control of airspace, territorial water, international passages, and electromagnetic spheres. And then uh, the current wall, separation wall or fixation wall or apartheid wall will be demolished and will be replaced by a wall that's four times the length and the size of the current uh, wall. And um, Palestinians will, li will live in enclaves and they can't do anything without the consent of the Israelis. And if they want to build a church, a mosque, a school, a road, they can, but as long as it doesn't contradict with Israel's 
uh, interests and Israel's uh, aspiration. Jerusalem united uh, with the, the old city will be under full Israeli sovereignty and uh, freedom of, of worship uh, to the holy places will be in the hands and control of the Israeli security forces. And the Palestinian capital will be Kufur Aqab, Shafat refugee camp, and Abu Dis, which are areas totally outside the historic uh, Jerusalem for Christians and Muslims. Abu Dis, Kufur Aqab, Mukhaim Shafat, uh, uh, Shafat refugee camp. That, that's it. As far as the refugees are concerned, no rights to return to Israel. And those who would return to Palestine will be subject to vetting, a veto. Israel will have a veto on every single one who wishes. Khalil Jashan wishes to come back to his country. It, it, you have to get the approval, not for your so-called state, but from the Israelis. And there'll be a, an international mechanism that will deal with this and compensations and housing. But also there'll be another international mechanism that will deal with compensation, compensating Jews who are from, from the Arab uh, countries. And uh, as far as uh, um, the, 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 the other issues are concerned, uh, you know, the borders and, and settlements, and then once, and, and then it says that between west of the Jordan River, it is the historic Jewish land. So they drop Palestinian narrative, Arab narrative, Muslim narrative, Christian narrative. Um, uh, and once we accept all these conditions for Israel, the Jewish state, Jerusalem, United Capital of Israel, whatever they said, I said to you, then we may have a state and call ourselves a state, but we should know that it is, uh, it will, not, it not, will not have any symbol of sovereignty. It'll be a fake state just by name, just to satisfy our uh, feelings. Now, this is the summary of the plan. And by the way, they were so smart in terms of, uh, you know, thinking of how to fool people, uh, because I believe this team was the combination of arrogance and ignorance. I'm not, you know, uh, uh, being dishonest here. I'm really saying the truth, because they say, they have a line, they say that peace based on the truth. But realizing and reading the 602 pages of minutes I have with them, I think these people constituted the combination of arrogance and ignorance. And uh, they introduced the plan. And now what they are doing is, at, at this moment, they're uh, studying what would the reaction of Palestinians be, their tactics, is let's see and say that there are differences between American administration and annexation. And next day, there are differences between Israelis and annexation. The third day, there will be a phone ringing on your side, Khalil. <laughs> There's a phone ringing in your side, Khalil. Okay, we got okay. it. Okay, you got it. And, and third day, there are differences between Americans and Israelis. So the tactics they're playing, I think maybe before the end of this month, they will say, okay, we convinced Netanyahu, he made a concession. Oh, he's gonna only do 6% or 8% annexation of the so-called settlement blocks in Gosh Atzion, Ereel, Ma'ale Adumim, and, and Palestinians should come to the table to negotiate the, the swaps. They, so they, and that's, that's their game. Their game is to use the terms we used in previous negotiations. They use the term Palestinian state in, in a different context, totally a fake state. They use the term Jer capital uh, Jerusalem for Palestinians, but it's absolutely not Jerusalem, Kufr Aqab and Shafat. They use the term land swaps, and which is not existence there because the land swaps they're offering there uh, is, is absolutely not one and one, not equal in size and value. They, uh, they use the term security for both, but they kept everything in the hands of uh, Israel. And uh, so the terms were, th that were used to fool the world in, in two, two pages, minutes, they distribute to the world to say, oh, we're giving Palestinians a state, we're giving Palestinians security, we're giving Palestinians capital in Jerusalem, we're giving this and this and this. It's just a game of deceit that they play. Now, they're studying how will the Palestinian reaction be. Uh, will Palestinian authority collapse? Some people say that we will dissolve the Palestinian Authority. No, we're not thinking about dissolving the Palestinian Authority. What we're saying is that the Palestinian Authority was born in a contractual nature with Israel to deliver Palestinians from occupation to independence through negotiations. That's the role of the Palestinian Authority. 
Now Kushner and Netanyahu and Trump are saying the role and function of the Palestinian Authority will change to a services authority that will be part of the, uh, the, the assuring the, the permanency of the occupation, which cannot, which cannot stand and the Palestinian Authority will not survive. Will Palestinians have an intifada? Will they have this? They're studying all these things. And then, you know, Kushner said recently in a circle that, well, we heard that there'll be disasters, there'll be uh, character, there'll be this after we uh, recognize Jerusalem and Gulen, and nothing happened, and nothing, hap nothing will happen uh, this time. Uh, they're studying the reaction of Egypt and Jordan, in particular, about the peace treaties they have. And they're not listening carefully to what King Abdullah of Jordan and Sisi of Egypt are saying. Uh, they're studying the European reaction, try, trying to fragment, you know, Europe's 27 foreign policies after Britain, and they're not one foreign policy. So they're trying to see uh, the seriousness of what they say about sanctions, punishment uh, against Israel. And they're telling everyone you can oppose, you can be free to say no, to condemn, because Netanyahu can survive 1,000 condemnations. And, but don't take any actions, any serious sanctions against uh, Israel. They're also studying the reaction of Russia, China, Japan to do, uh, to, to see what the reaction uh, will be. They're also threatening the International Criminal Court because now we're about to hear from the, chamber, the first chamber there to see to, to, about the, the territorial jurisdiction. And we hope to hear in the next few days uh, uh, on this. Now, what, what are uh, our options as Palestinians? Our option ha has been, number one, we have been doing every possible effort in order to not to have the annexation, to cancel the annexation. And we had distributed uh, uh, to the quartet and to the international community a non-paper specifying our commitment to the two-state solution on 1967, to uh, international law, to convening an international conference, uh, that will relaunch negotiations on the basis of international law, agreement signed, and, and to achieve end of occupation and two states on 1967 and solving all core issues as per agreements, as was agreed by the two sides. We have contacted all nations on earth. We have 192 nations of the 194 members of the uh, uh, General Assembly that say no to annexation and that condemn and they did not, nobody, nobody had accepted the plan of Trump and uh, uh, Netanyahu because it's, it's just, as I said, copied and pasted. It's, it's not going to fly. But at the same time, we have not seen yet uh, an international coalition telling Netanyahu, if you go ahead with annexation, there'll be consequences. There'll be an effect in your standing with us commercially, trade, investments, politics, and so on. We haven't seen this yet. And if we don't see this yet, you know, the, the Netanyahu and Trump have not invented the annexation. You know, can ask friend, France and Algeria, 130 years, 1.5 million killed. You can ask Italy in annexing Ethiopia. You can ask Ethiopia when they annexed Eritrea. You can ask Iraq, uh, Saddam, when they called Kuwait province number 19. And you can ask the British in Ireland and, and the long, the list go on and on and on and on. Because if you, we, I, I as a Palestinian, as an Arab, uh, we have not participated in drafting any of these laws referred to as international law, not uh, the Hague 1907, not the uh, 1920 uh, League of Nations Convention, not the Kilogrand uh, Pact 1928, not the Paris Pact of 1928, not the first chapter, Article 2.4 of the uh, Charter of the UN, uh, and not uh, the Fourth Geneva Convention. Okay, occupation, something illegal. Occupation is temporary, but if you want to make it permanent, you move to annexation, to an, which is totally a war crime. That's the definition of annexation. That's how they define in their international law. But you know, you, you read what uh, Jason Greenblatt wrote recently, and what he said actually once in the Security Council that uh, don't be uh, so shallow. Uh, there is, you should not even refer to international law. And you hear Pompeo saying that we walk with Jesus to uh, recognize uh, settlements. And uh, we walk with Jesus to give Israel the right to annexation because that's what will make peace. So 
on the one hand, now Jesus is standing against me as a Palestinian, and uh, history is standing against me against, as a Palestinian, religion is standing against me as a Palestinian, uh, language is standing me against me as a Palestinian simply because I recognized Israel right to exist and live in peace and security next to the state of Palestine on 1967 borders. And Khalil, the two-state solution is not my position. It's my concession. It was Henry Kissinger who imposed, Secretary Kissinger, who imposed on us four conditions. Recognize Israel in 67, accept resolutions 242 and 338, renounce violence, join negotiations. And we accepted these negotiations. So the two-state solution is not my position. It's my concession. And if, if I now repeat in front of these people, the Kushners and the Greenblatts and the Perkovits and the Adelsons and the Netanyahu's that I'm with two states to live and let live with Israel on 67 borders, uh, I, I think the sentence will be shoot him. He's not realistic and he doesn't belong to the world and he's hallucinating and he should be, uh, because the, the, the term they use, peace based on the truth. And the truth is that this team and their package constitute the ultimate arrogance and uh, ignorance uh, combination. Now, I'm sure that they will move to an axe somehow, irrespective of that, uh, that we've seen some really encouraging movement in the Congress and the Senate uh, against annexation, calling for two states, rights of integration for Palestinians. And we've seen, uh, you know, the think tanks, and we've seen the universities, the churches. We've seen a major change taking place in the U.S., which is really very encouraging, and we should uh, build on it. And I really want Palestinians all the time. We're repeating this to, to tell them this is not who the U.S. is. Trump and his team does not represent who the U.S. is. I'm not saying that other administration were not biased towards Israel, but no one had come to copy and paste the settlers' councils' positions and Netanyahu's positions and put it as a fair package that Palestinians must accept and they must be dictated upon. So they move with this. The changes in, in, in Palestine and the Palestinians will be uh, alienating themselves from the two-state solution and their position will develop to uh, one state equal rights because Netanyahu and Trump are offering them now one state, two systems. An African, there is no English word or no, no Hebrew, no Arabic word. It's an African result called apartheid, all right? Uh, so what will happen at this, at this time? Uh, okay, the people like ourselves who have lived their lives and devoting it for the two-state solution to live and let live and so on, yeah, we will, will, will be destroyed. That's what Netanyahu has made intention. Because at that moment, uh, he will tell the world, we cannot accept what they're offering, one state, uh, equal rights, that will diminish Israel, its Jewish nature, and so on. And they don't accept uh, what we offer them as peace, you know, apartheid that is good for them, and they should try it at least. That's one part of Palestinians. The other part of Palestinians is uh, the other groups, Hamas and others, who don't believe in two-state solution. And that's why Netanyahu is very, very keen at keeping the split between the West Bank and Gaza. Because if you don't believe in the two-state solution, come on, that's a common ground. If you don't believe in uh, the PLO as, as a solid representative of the Palestinian people, that's also a common ground. Because I think, uh, you know, Netanyahu's doctrine, he believes that a strong and prosperous Israel needs conflict and not peace. Matched and combined with the Trump's doctrine, that nations are either born to be strong or to find strong nations to protect them at the right price, you will have, <laughs> you will have a system that can excuse anything and can do anything towards chaos, lawlessness, and, and, and bloodshed. And I think that's where we are uh, today. If they go with the uh, annexations, we have done our best in this leadership, President Abbas, Saad, all the PLO leadership to preserve the two-state solution, to preserve the chance for uh, you know, solving the problems by peaceful means and in accordance with agreement signs and international law and ending the occupation. And you have Netanyahu and Trump who are determined that this no longer works and what works is one state, two systems apartheid. And this will, will you know, I, I live, I'm speaking to you from the house I was born in. I was 12 years old 
when the occupation came, came to my hometown, Jericho. I'm 65 now with eight grandchildren. The day after the annexation, I'll be a Christian, a Muslim, Palestinian, this will not change. And, and maybe there'll be more roadblocks and so on. But today, from here, Jericho, to the Mediterranean, I, the Christian, Muslim, Palestinian, am 50.9% of the population. Once again, 50.9% of the population. Friedman and Netanyahu and Kushner are 49.9% of the population. A question to them today, what are you going to do with me? You want to keep Gaza? You want to have Arabs support Gaza so you keep the split? Because you realize that there will not be a state without Gaza and there will not be a state in Gaza? Is that your choice? You want to turn this conflict into a religious conflict? That's the worst thing that could out, be the outcome of this administration. Because Khalil, you know, and you, your audience should know that as Palestinians, Judaism to us was never a threat, is not a threat, will never be a threat. We don't fight the Israelis over something written in their holy book. Our conflict with Israel is a political one, territorial one, narrative. But these people, when they say that they walk with Jesus to legalize settlement, this is not who Jesus is. This is not who the U.S. is. This is not who human beings are. Because putting Palestinians and Israelis on harm's way, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I lost my nephew. This is the second one in two years. Shot and killed in cold blood. And the excuse is there. All right? That's the destiny that Trump and Netanyahu want for Palestinians and Israelis. That's exactly what they design, what their design will produce. The last thing I want to say about Arabs and all what they say that Arabs are moving in normalization with Israel and this and so I know. I know that Kushner used everything in the book not to create normalization. He wants to create alliances between some Arab countries and uh, Israel against Iran, against this and against that. This will not happen. This cannot happen. This cannot happen. We have to defeat extremists. ISIS is not, as the, the people in the United States scholars say, uh, an extremist Muslim movement. They have nothing to do with Islam. These are thugs and murderers and killers. And ISIS is 803, 803 in my research, of those who went to mosques to use God, not to worship God. And we should defeat these forces of extremism. And if you want to defeat them, two things are needed. Because Trump did not develop the technique to kill ideas with bullets. He did not develop the techniques to prevent ideas to travel with or without visas. They travel. Number one, peace between Palestinians and Israelis. And here you don't need to reinvent the wheel or eat the apple from the start. It's going to be two states, the state of Palestine with East Jerusalem, its capital, to live in peace and security next to the state of Israel in 67. And the second thing you need in this region is democracy in the Arab world. And anyone who says Arabs are not ready for democracy is a racist. Actually, the real threat on us as Arabs is neither this country or that country. It's us Arabs. 58% of us are less than 20 years of age. And this is the time to revisit our economic structure, social structure, educational structure, health structures. That's, that's what's needed. But when you have an administration that is putting everything they have against the Palestinians, they have taken 48 steps to punish us, including defunding hospitals in East Jerusalem, the only cancer center, the only eye center, defunding UNRWA, refugee camps, closing our office in Washington, closing the American consulate that did a brilliant job in serving Palestinian-American relations since 1844, and 48 steps just to punish Palestinians simply because we want a fair deal. And peace is, at the end of the day, peacemaking is what negotiating, reaching a common ground between the two sides that will enable them to stand in front of their people and say, we did not get you everything, but what we got is fair. Now, the Trump administration and Netanyahu want me to stand in front of Palestinians and say, oh, I'm sorry, I had to accept this because had I not accepted this, I would not have hospitals, schools, universities, roads, living, salaries, and so on. If they annex one inch or 1,000 square kilometers, mark my word, Khalil, Netanyahu will be fully responsible in accordance with the Fourth Geneva Conventions. He will collect the garbage in Jericho and in Tel Aviv. He will be responsible for everything because the authority will not be an instrument for the permanency of this occupation.
thank you very much and I took some more time. Uh, uh, that's all right. Uh, so if you have a question from uh, Saeed, uh, Rikad, uh, referring back to your earlier statement that over the past 30 years since Madrid, there's been kind of an abysmal failure in delivering uh, to the uh, Palestinians. Uh, what make you think, uh, as the Palestinian Authority today, that you can uh, be able to, to, to deliver to the Palestinian people at this late stage without putting forward a viable plan yourself? No, we, we have a plan, and yes, Saeed knows very well, and everybody who follows us knows very well, that we uh, have done everything humanly possible in order to uh, you know, build uh, our uh, state institutions. Uh, we have done everything humanly possible to move on in the agreement signed because the self-government is a concept of limitations on us. And uh, the Israelis, uh, various governments actually, not Netanyahu alone, um, all the time they thought that the Palestinian state is a threat on them. And uh, the, 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 the idea today is that either the Palestinian Authority will take Palestinians towards independence or the Palestinian Authority will be destroyed. We cannot be part of any scheme that will make us uh, a tool in the making the Israeli occupation permanent, the permanency of the occupation. That's impossible. So we're not talking about uh, uh, you know, uh, dissolving or uh, uh, the authority and people's needs and so on. Yes, it's our job to provide uh, people's needs. But if uh, people's needs here, uh, the cost will be to dissolve the Palestinian national movement and Palestinian national identity and the liquidation of Palestinian rights to determination and statehood, we're not going to be part of that. We're not going to be part of that. And I'm saying it in the full sense of the word. Netanyahu will be fully responsible. In 1992, there used to be salaries, the occupation. They used to collect garbage. They used to be teachers, nurses, doctors. And they will do the same. And the PLO will continue being the sole legitimate representative of the Palestinian people. We are 13 million Palestinians worldwide. No difference between one who lives in Washington or Buenos Aires or Alaska or Lagos or Jericho or Gaza or Jerusalem. Just one thing about Palestinian nationalism is what do you do in your profession to bring Palestine back to the map? I don't want people with red pens to correct my what I do, what I do wrong and so on. I'm not saying I'm not I don't commit mistakes, but I, when I work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the last thing anyone is gonna be standing to me and carrying a red pen to tell me this is right and this is wrong. Show me your work. Show me what you do to bring Palestine back to the map. That's what I ask every Palestinian to ask themselves every single day, right? So we are in no position today to speak about options. One option, he moves to the annexation, he will be responsible from the River Jordan to the Mediterranean. Palestinian Authority will not be part of the permanency of the occupation under no circumstances. Thank you. The next question is from uh, Professor John Quigley. Uh, he says, annexation means termination of belligerent occupation. With no longer having military uh, necessity, Israel mm -hmm. will have no legal basis for retaining uh, use right of Palestinian owned land on which settlements have been built. Is there a plan to resort to the UN Security Council or a conference of the parties to the fourth Geneva Convention to enfor enforce the use right of Palestinian owners? Actually, yes, there, are, there is a plan for the Security Council and we know our limitations there. There is a plan to convene and we call contact with the gavel holder, Switzerland, to convene a meeting for the, for the contracting parties of the Fort Geneva Convention. And there is a, a big file uh, that's being prepared on annexation and settlements. And the one in settlements we already referred, there was a referral on it to the ICC, the International Criminal Court, and there'll be a new one uh, concerning the annexation, because I think Professor Quigley is right, is just moving occupation towards uh, permanency uh, through uh, means of trying to legalize it because uh, a superpower can legalize things. That's what they think. I haven't, I haven't seen it uh, before, but I'm seeing it now. Uh, all options are, are open in this field. But the, the, only, thing, the only thing is that, uh, you know, I don't think that, the, and when I say that, that I'm 50.9% of the population today, I'm not, I'm not making a threat to anyone. All I'm saying simply, they have 
you know, can they really have us in, 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 in the prison camps and start eliminating us? I don't think they'll do that. Not because they're worried about the reaction from the world or countries or something. Because they know very well, Palestinians will not stand up in lines waiting to die. We will not do that. And they cannot have mass transfers for us. Because at the same time, we will not stand on lines to be transferred. And we will not leave our territory. And we say it with a full voice. We have the full right to defend ourselves. And we will. We will. We have sought peace because we valued lives. We want to save lives. And we want to live and let live with Israel. And we recognize Israel. But if they have in the 21st century people who believe that they can through force and through intimidation and through blackmail and through uh, economic measures and punishment of the Palestinians and, and using everything uh, word in the book in the international community to bring us to, uh, to, to our knees, uh, this will not happen. So the question is to them today more than me. What, <laughs> what are they going to do? Maybe in the short term, Netanyahu is happy, satisfied, he's going to win uh, the elections next time, and Trump is, uh, and, and, and children Adelson will be happy at him, and uh, Kushner and all these ideologues. You know, when, when you deal with people who believe that, you know, I was told by them that we did not recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital. It's God who did. <laughs> when, you, when you get to the level of this way of thinking, of states, states, statesmanship and superpowers, you know, there was a, a, a U.S. president called Theodore Roosevelt. He said the White House is an office of international morality. And I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more because the more power, the more morality and, and responsibility should have. But this White House needs giant statesmen, not people who think, you know, of uh, buildings in New York, real estate agents. We're not a building in New York to be dealt with in the minds of the consequences of this. Let's play this game. Let's use this term and use the, the, the other term. I, I, and as I said, you know, the, 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 the question to them is, is valid. We have recognized Israel. They did not recognize Palestine. We have come a long way on all the negotiations and people know the truth by now. Even though the blame game, finger pointing, everything is pointed against us and this web of lies and immoral and uh, 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 business they deal with us on, on daily matter to, 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 to prove their point. And then what have they done? Have they recognized the state of Palestine? No. Have they recognized the right of Palestinian people's determination? No. Have they recognized the right of Palestinians Ownership to their land? No. Even the people of East Jerusalem who have been annexed since 1967, de facto and legally in 1980, they're not residents. <laughs> That's the truth. So it's, 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 it's such racism, such apartheid, and such a system that functions in 19, in 2020, and it's tolerated uh, and act with impunity. And my, my belief is not about where I go in Security Council, ICC, and so on. You know, when Netanyahu stands up two days ago and say, my trade with Europe, with the EU, when I came to office in 2009, was 17 billion euros. Now it's 39 billion euros. E billion euros. We're being rewarded. So as long as Israel is acting, international community is acting it with immunity, no punishment, no sanctions, even settlement products are being allowed shamelessly to be sold in European and American and other markets, all right, which is a crime, a war crime. I think that's what's needed. What's needed is an international coalition that will tell Israel, if you continue with the policies of settlements and annexation, your standing economically, politically, commercially will be negatively affected. That's how you stop Israel. Otherwise, we're here and we're here to stay. I'm speaking to you from Jericho. I'm 11,000 years old. This is my narrative, and I have nowhere else to go. I am here, and I'm here to stay. And my grandchildren are much more nationalists about their Palestine and their self-determination and their freedom and dignity than me. Uh, thank you. Uh, the next question deals with the, uh, the issue of the one-state solution. As you know, over the past uh, few weeks, this issue has come to the forefront, uh, particularly even within the Jewish community here in the United States. 
uh, and a debate, a heated debate, has emerged uh, here in Washington, in the States, and, and also uh, in Israel. Benjamin Lotto wants to know, uh, how can you envision a one-state solution given the current status quo geopolitically in Israel, Palestine? Is it even possible uh, to consider that at this point? It's a very civilized concept. It's a very civilized concept for Jews, Muslims, and Christians to live together as equal. What's wrong with that? Why not? We're people, we're equal, and we can, uh, can do it. But they tell me, oh, you want to destroy Israel. You want to undermine Israel's Jewish nature. So I respond, but I have recognized you on 1967 borders, 78% of historic British mandated Palestine. And you came back to me with this map. That's your answer. I hope you see the map. That's your answer. So if, if we say one state equal rights, we want to destroy the Jewish nature of Israel. And if we say two states in 1967, live and let live, that's not the truth that peace needs. The truth that peace needs in accordance with the genius uh, uh, Kushner, who read 25 books, my God, you know, uh, is, is this, is, is, is upper side. So what, what is it that they want? They, we will entertain and accept, and as I told you, honestly, you can say whatever you want to say about Palestinians. Judaism to us was never a threat, is not a threat, will never be a threat. Judaism is one of God's great religions to the Christian and Muslim Palestinians. That's the truth. And Jews have always lived equals. We've never had any sectarian clashes in our history till the emergence of those immigrants who came from Russia in the 1880s. And I, I don't want to go and give a history a lecture now. But the point is, why not? If you don't want two states, if it really bothers you so much to have a Palestinian state, if Palestinians threaten a country with 3,000 tanks, 2,000 fighting planes, nuclear weapons, Congress, Senate, everything they have. If a Palestinian state on 22% of historic Palestine threatened them so much, then what, what about one state equal rights? No, you want to undermine the Jewish nature of it. So what will keep Israel's Jewish nature? Apartheid, racism, bigotry, reopening the chapters of South Africa. Haven't you tried it in the 40s and 50s and 60s in the US? Haven't you tested what it means for segregation and so on. Repeating, repeating these lessons, is, the, is, is, that, is that the answer for Israel's survival? Is that how you make Israel a Jewish state? Is that the meaning of a Jewish state in 2020? I really appreciate all those courageous Jewish voices I've been following on, on, in their articles, in their writings, and the members of Congress, members of Senate, who stood tall for the two-state solution on for Palestinian rights to determination and for rejection of this. The idea of Trump and Netanyahu is not a peace idea. It's a racist apartheid plan. That's the truth. And it will not fly. Uh, our next question comes from Mohammed Shinawi from uh, The Voice of America. How would the Israeli law of 2014 requiring a referendum to allow any Israeli prime minister to give back any annexed lands impact uh, any potential peace talks with the Palestinians, including swaps of land? What, what, what they play with this, they, they, there are laws that were passed by Israel called the national law that says from the river Jordan to the Mediterranean, the only people who have rights to determination are Jews. The only language is Hebrew. Imagine in the, in the land of, the, of al Aqsa Mosque and, and the Holy Sepulchre, and uh, the basis of, of, of Arabs and, 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 and Christianity and, and Islam, the Arabic language is no longer an official language here. And people other than Jews don't have the rights to determination. They have laws that call sterilized roads, sterilized roads. I cannot you know, use these roads. They sterilized out of this pandemic, okay? They have buses called sterilized buses, okay? They still make me go with an ID that's green in color. Theirs are yellow, uh, blue, I'm sorry. Their car's license are yellow. Mine's is red, is, is white and, and, and green. 
So uh, we all we all know. I know in practice that this, this is a racist, bigot, apartheid state. That's 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 true. So so what do they want? To do? They don't want two states. They don't want one state. They don't. They want to maintain one state, two systems, and this will not fly. This will not fly. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Ricard, uh, you know the U.S. very well. You spent a lot of time here. And um, do you think that if uh, November 3rd, uh, the elections uh, replace, if you will, uh, Mr. Trump and Biden uh, takes over uh, as the next president, uh, do you think U.S. policy will change and some of these issues that you have been raising might be uh, reversed in the future regarding Palestine? Absolutely, absolutely. If they look, if they look for peace and security and defeating extremism in this region, Trump did not develop the techniques to kill ideas with bullets. You need peace between Palestinians and Israelis. And yes, if if the new administration comes to office, Mr. Biden wins. First thing he needs to do is to reopen the the, the American consulate in East Jerusalem. <clears throat> is to open the uh, the Palestinian mission in in, in Washington is to re reiterate U.S. position as all American administration, two states, 1967, with the mutually agreed swaps, uh, agreed by the two sides, and, 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 and no side should take any steps that may uh, unilaterally impede or preempt or prejudge these issues. This is the U.S. position. And if, if they want a stable Middle East, if they want a democratic Middle East, if they want uh, to defeat the forces of extremism in this region, and we should do that with them, they, of course, they need to, and I think everything they have that Trump, uh, Trump did, who, 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 you know, uh, Israel uh, annexed Jerusalem officially in, in 1967 by extending the borders de facto, and they wrote a letter to the UN saying this is not annexation, this is just administrative move. And then in 1980, the, uh, the, the Supreme Court said that it's part of Israel, so annexation. No one recognized this. I think it was Costa Rica, and then they changed their mind. Now they have the U.S. that have recognized Trump, the Trump administration, that have recognized Jerusalem as the capital and moved them. Who else did it? No one. Uh, they have recognized settlements, and Pompeo, Secretary of State, is proudly stating that he's working with Jesus. Settlements are legal, and uh, uh, annexation are uh, is legal, and so on. And uh, once again. This is not the Jesus that we know. This is not who Jesus is. Jesus never in any verse said anything against Palestinians. Jesus loves Palestinians as much as he loves Nigerians, Jews, uh, uh, Guatemalans, uh, Arabs, um, uh, Chinese. That's what Jesus is about. Jesus is not uh, about conflict, bloodshed, and, and, and murder. And this should stop. Turning this conflict into a religious one should stop immediately. You can keep this, your ideas to yourself because we have enough in our sides who want to turn this conflict into a religious one. Don't you think we have Muslims who believe that this is waqf territory? Don't you think that there are people on my side who refuse to shake my hands because I negotiate and recognize Israel? And to whose interest you're trying to change this conflict from a political one into a religious conflict? This must stop. Yeah, and, and the U.S. with the new administration must immediately with courage and must stand tall and must act like a superpower and must make once again the White House an office of international morality that people look up to. Uh, Saeb, you referred earlier to some of the changes and courageous positions uh, taken by uh, some on the Democratic side of the aisle here, um, particularly members of Congress, both House uh, and Senate. Are you uh, the Palestinian Authority or the PLO in, in touch with any of these Democratic uh, Party members? Yes, yes, I am in touch uh, with many. I'm in touch with many Jewish leaders in the United States. I'm in touch with many Israelis, actually, who are here, who oppose the annexation and are with the two-state solution. And we, we, you know, whether you are pro-Israel, pro-Palestinian, that's your business, but at the end of the day, we are pro-peace. That's what counts. Being pro-peace being pro means being pro-state of Palestine with East Jerusalem's capital to live side by side in peace and security 
with the state of Israel in 1967 borders is I'm in touch and I'm in touch with many others actually uh, whoever wants to help in, in saving lives uh, of Palestinians and Israelis who wants to help in maintaining hope in the minds of Palestinians and Israelis who want to help in preventing this region from going down the drain in, in the hands of extremists because you know we need to, we need to do it we, we as I told you from the first sentence I told you no one benefits more from reaching an agreement and having an end to this conflict more than Palestinians and no one stands to lose more in the absence of peace more than Palestinians and I think I really I really stand tall with with, with encouragement and you know when we see letters from the Congress and the Senate uh, going to Benjamin Netanyahu or to Gantz or to Pompeo or to, or to President Trump, we do a lot with it here in, in our papers and our writings and all to tell Palestinians, look, look, what Trump did is not who the U.S. is. This is, this is the American voices that you should listen to. They're with you. You're not alone because you want to keep hope alive in the minds of people here. Because if, you, if, if, if the intention of Jared Kushner is to leave people desperate, Desperation would lead to desperate acts. And who will, who will bear the responsibility of this? Who, who will? It is the blood of my children and grandchildren, and also Israeli children and grandchildren. And there is another way. The other way is to stop annexation, to cancel annexation, to take off the table this plan of apartheid, and to bring Palestinians and Israelis through an international umbrella to achieve international law, to achieve the end of occupation, to achieve the realization of the state of Palestine with the Jerusalem's capital to live side by side in peace and security with the state of Israel. Uh, Saeb, a, a couple of questions back. You uh, referred uh, to your perception of uh, Jesus and his uh, teachings. And uh, I know that uh, you spoke for both uh, Palestinian Muslims like yourself and Palestinian Christians like myself. Uh, Jeff uh, Wheelwright would like to know, what is the role from your perspective of Christian Zionism? in this whole conflict? To be honest with you, I, you know, three, four weeks ago, I was in a Zoom meeting with 10 to 15 uh, evangelicals, uh, you know, and uh, I just want to ask, you know, a question. Why, why do they make Jesus against me? Why, 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 where did they invent that Jesus is against Palestinians? Or against, this is the whole, the whole idea of Jesus is, is 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 the, the other side of life is forgiveness is living and letting live it's graciousness it's saving lives even in, in the books of jews you know in the judaism one drop of blood is equivalent to the whole universe so those individuals who use mosques churches and synagogues to make jesus or my prophet muhammad or or Moses look like they are with conflict and bloodshed and so on. This is not the religion we know. This is not the Jesus we know. And, and I, why, yani, somebody needs to stand tall for them and, 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 and tell them this is not Christianity. This is not Christianity. Christianity is not about, you know, hating Palestinians or forcing the Palestinians out of their homes or demolishing Palestinian homes or extrajudicial killing of Palestinian children or preventing universities functioning or hospitals working? How can they? How dare they? And where do they get this from? You know, we have 13 churches in Palestine. I will declare it with full voice. We will maintain the status quo of, of all religions. That's the truth. That's the truth about us. And we have never, and I say again and again and again, Judaism, my conflict is not with Judaism. It's not against Judaism. On the contrary, on the contrary, I want to live and let live. I am with the two-state solution. I'm with the state of Palestine, with East Jerusalem's capital, to live side by side, the state of Israel in 67 borders. That's for the sixth time I'm repeating it so people can hear that. And I know this is not popular to say here in Palestine today because I think the majority of my people are telling me to shut up. And enough and they want to go the other way of, 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 of one state equal rights. But I'm also entitled to my opinion. And I believe that if not this year, in 10 years and 50 years, Palestinians and Israelis will come back, sit down, but the question will be, Khalil, how many would have lost 
our children in 50 years. And you know what's the worst thing in life? I'm telling you from my experience, my, my both nephews in, in less than two years, the worst thing that could happen to any person on earth, a mother and a father, is to take their loved ones to the cemetery to bury them. It's the other way around. They should take us to the cemetery. And if, if, if those uh, Christians believe that we should take our children to the graveyards, and Trump and Netanyahu believes that we should continue taking our children to the, to the graveyard, that's a new teaching, that's a new vision, that's a new, I don't think it's, it's, it's anything relating to humanity or to us as human beings. Heresy is the word from a Christian perspective, uh, Saad. Uh, at any rate, you just mentioned that some people in Palestine are, are, are not happy uh, with your position and uh, the way you articulated it. And I'm sure you've uh, faced some tough questions before. Uh, which, which takes us to uh, Abdul Hamid uh, Siyam, who is asking uh, b basically, uh, would you admit that you are part of the problem and not part of the solution at this time when you consider that discrepancy in public opinion uh, in Palestine and their positions uh, of uh, the authority? I, I, I tell Abdul Hamid I can't stand guards on people's lips. I haven't developed the technique yet. I can't stand guards on people's lips. I can't start in Palestinians' way of thinking. I think every person in Palestine, every Palestinian out of 13 million Palestinian has the full right to express themselves. But I tell Abdul Hamid, I did not come to any of my positions without being elected, whether it's in the Legislative Council, in Fatah Central Committee, in the PLO Executive Committee, in every job I do. I was not elected by 92%. I think the last elections I was elected by 52% of the votes. And uh, as far as your question or the insinuation you put to me. So I was 13 years old when the settlements began. I was 12 years old when the occupation came to this house, my house that I live in, in Jericho. I'm not responsible for the continuation of settlements. It's not my wrongdoing that I wanted to engage in peace based on international law to achieve the two-state solution. I don't, I don't regret any of this. The mistake is to those who were given the choice between peace and settlements, they chose settlements, and they chose dictation, and they chose the arrogance of power, and the arrogance and arrogance. That's the mistake. So if you want to insinuate, Abdul Hamid, that it's my mistake that they, we have more settlements because I agreed to negotiate, you're wrong. There's nothing wrong with negotiations. Negotiation is not an objective by itself. It's a civilized tool used between any individual or another when they have problems to solve it through talking, okay? And, and bringing the common ground. So settlements were going on before we began the negotiations. Confiscation of lands, home demolitions, war crimes, siege, closures. And in each Palestinian household, you'll either find somebody in prison, somebody wounded, somebody maimed, or somebody dead, martyred. So why do you want to put me in this position that uh, yani when you see that Israel is doing all of these things, that you want to say, it's my mistake. What, who? who Whose purpose does it serve? And what kind of logic can you convince people with? There is an occupying power. I was 12 years old when the occupation came to this home in Jericho at the Jordan River. I don't see one million Arab soldiers and Muslim soldiers wanting to liberate Palestine and telling them, stop, stop, let me finish my negotiations. And what we did is we abided by international law and we should stand tall. And I urge all Palestinians to stand tall with international law and the rule of law and the bridge of civilization and the bridge between religions and coexistence and solving problems by peaceful means, because that was, that's what Palestine is all about. Uh, thank you, Saeb. Uh, we, let's conclude with a couple of quick questions, a couple of minutes each, if you don't mind. Uh, one um, pertains, again, to the, there are quite a few questions pertaining to the one state solution. And this one basically is saying, what is the tipping point? I mean, when would the PLO switch strategies from the two state to one state? Uh, well, I don't know if the PLO will switch from two states to one state. As I told you, my position as Secretary General of the PLO now and Palestinian PLO factions is that we are with the two state solution. We are with international law. But I'm sure that in the near future, once they, if they go with the annexation, uh, Palestinian political life is very lively. And every 25 years in my research, we have a transition, a national transition. And I think it's about time. There'll be a meeting for the Palestinian National Council 
that's the institution. That's the highest legislative body we have. I'm sure there will be new faces coming from the five continents to it. And if they want to introduce uh, a new charter, uh, new principles of one state uh, uh, equal rights, which we, by the way, that was the charter of the PLO when we began in 1965. If they want to go back to it, it's going to be votes. And as I, I, I told you, Khalil, whenever we differ as Palestinians, and I tell every Palestinian, it's ballots and not bullets. We solve our differences by ballots and not bullets. So that's, that's the only way to change the Palestinian position is by the PNC, the Palestinian National Council, or the Central Council of the PLO meeting and voting uh, uh, for uh, this position. I, uh, the, the position Abu Mazen announced the 19th of May, uh, which was, uh, the, uh, you refer to as May 20th, but was May, May 19th, actually. It was decisions already uh, voted for in the PNC and the Palestine uh, Central Council to uh, uh, consider the interim period over and to say that since Israel abandoned and revoked all agreements signed, we're not going to be the only body that will stand uh, to, uh, to, to honor our commitments while Israel is entrenching its, its apartheid racist regime and occupation. Okay, let, let's conclude with this question from Benjamin uh, Rogers. Uh, there has been uh, media reports uh, lately that the PLO has submitted some type of peace proposals to the quartet. Can you discuss any specifics of this? Yes, there was a letter sent by me actually to the quartet members uh, uh, and uh, an unpapered distributed worldwide uh, because nations have asked us where, where do we stand? And we reiterated our position that we are fully uh, with international law, international legitimacy, Security Council, and General Assembly resolution. And we uh, summarized where the negotiations have reached in every single uh, issue. And we expressed our readiness to, uh, to, be, to, to take part of an international conference with full uh, responsibilities on the basis of international law and the basis of relevant resolutions of the Security Council General Assembly, agreement signed, terms of references agreed upon, that will ensure the end of the occupation and the establishment of Palestinian state or the realization of the independence of the state of Palestine on 1967 borders with East Jerusalem's capital and solving all core issues, including refugees in accordance with the relevant international laws within a time frame of one year. That's what we, uh, it's not a peace plan. It's not, I cannot call it like this, this was, a summary answering questions to all nations on earth that we stand tall with international law and we urge these nations to form an international coalition to convene an international conference to stand up against annexation and occupation and to stand with implementing and guided being guided by international law thank you sir <clears throat> i just wanted you to know that we have received uh, 33 questions and we are only halfway <laughs> through uh, so, uh, unfortunately, we have to end uh, the program at this point. And again, thank you so much for taking time of your busy schedule to be with us today. I hope you have uh, shed some light on, on many issues that uh, are of concern uh, to our uh, audience. And we look forward to meeting you again in future uh, programs. Uh, for our audience, thank you for being with us today. Uh, I invite you to join us again next Wednesday. Uh, the program is going to be on Syria and U.S. policy uh, in Syria. And the Wednesday after that, uh, our program is going to shift back to Palestinian-Israeli issues uh, and we'll be discussing basically internal political Israeli dynamics and the issue of annexation. Thanks and see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you for hosting me. Thank you. Thanks, Sal.